Try YouTube. Today I will be reviewing the Logitech GPRX Superlite 2. I'll tell you why I think it's the best mouse right now out there and I'll tell you what I mean when I say best. And I will also tell you why I think it's the most boring mouse by far out there. Let me start by telling you my experience with the old G Pro Wireless shape and class of mice. This is the very first G Pro. As you can see, it's kind of nasty. It's old. I used this for years. I used it a lot. It has grips on it because the coating of, on this one degraded really quickly and it's the very first batch which had a lot of double clicking issues so this one always double clicked and then at some point it just became unusable not a great product but still everyone started using it when it got released why because in its own way it was kind of revolutionary it was the very first wireless mouse that was light enough with a shape that wasn't too opinionated like the g305 that didn't need batteries and that whose wireless sensor was really, really completely solid. Like blind tests cannot tell the difference with wired versus wireless. And I can tell you many years before that, people tried doing wireless. I think Razer, I had some Razer wireless mouse and the latency was really noticeable. This is not like the G Pro wireless or like the modern wireless mice. So in its own way, it was kind of a big gap and they spent a lot in marketing. They got a lot of pros to start using it. So it really gained popularity. But honestly, at the time, I'm not sure there were mice that were much better on the market. The shape is completely uninspiring. Now, this is another G Pro Wireless that I had to buy because of the, mention, the problems that I mentioned with the other one. It was still my main mouse. Funnily enough, this is the mouse that I started my whole aim training journey on. And I got Grandmaster on this mouse. And uh, actually the Logitech mousepad, the Logitech G240 and the Logitech G Pro Wireless, the base one, were my main setup because I was a Counter-Strike player and that was kind of like the go-to. Um, and at the time I didn't have as many mice to play around with, so I went with the safest choice and that's what I played with. Then, you know what happened? This came out. Why? Because the market was catching up and 80 grams on the first G Pro Wireless was a little too much. And then they released the Superline, slightly better coating, definitely better mouse feed with a PTFE with no additives, whatever. Still micro USB, which was already kind of starting to be outdated a little bit at the time when this came out. And only 61 grams versus the 80 grams of the G Pro Wireless. This wasn't as big of a jump from the market as the original G Pro Wireless was, but it was still a big jump. So if you had the G Pro Wireless, you really wanted to have this super light after that. It was like a clear upgrade. Why wouldn't you want to have that? Better feeds, slightly better sensor, better coating or slightly better coating, lighter weight, etc. So after that, I also have this. It seems that the, the for some reason, the G Pro Wireless almost marked different eras in my, my history. This mouse, I won the day that I joined AIM Labs in an AIM Labs competition. It was a scattershot competition. And I won. It was a G2X Logitech competition. So this mouse, since I had for free, I use for experimenting. So I tried ceramic feet on this, core pads. So I've tried everything on the Superlight. And I'll be honest, for basically anyone, I would recommend just sticking to the default skates. I don't see why changing them. They're good enough. Good enough is probably should probably be the 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 main sentence about the G Pro X, it's good enough. It's almost too good enough. It's annoyingly so. And now we have this. Finally, they moved to USB-C. It's a little bit lighter. It's at 57 slash 58 grams. And they slightly changed the shape of the feed for some reason. They now have 2000 Hertz on a new uh, wireless receiver. They changed the, the switches to optical switches, which honestly I like. Some people say they're a little too stiff compared to the other G-Perk Superlight. Personally, I really like it. I think it's a small upgrade. It's a much smaller upgrade than the Superlight was to the base G-Pro wireless. So basically we're just building on top of something that was good enough and it's now even more good enough. I'm gonna start with the bar score instead of doing it at the end. The bar score is the new method that I'm using to compare mice based on my performance in a specific AIMLAB series of benchmarks. You can watch this video if you want to know more about it. And I wanna start with that because then I wanna kinda talk about how the Superlight to me, the Superlight 2 specifically, almost signifies the current state of the gaming peripherals and why I find it to be extremely boring and why I think it's the best mouse and I'm not happy about it. So here we go. 
This is the second time that I'm running the bar score. I ran at uh, the first time, it was on the hard pace, which got 82.5. I did it with the GPX2 and it got a very close 83.5. So right now the GPX2 slightly beats the hard pace. I actually did the GPX2 twice. So you can see that I played a lot of runs with it to test it and it got exactly the same score, 83.5 both times. As I noted down here, uh, because of the way the hard pace is shaped, the GPX is actually a little more fatiguing to me because of its very boring potato shape that doesn't really do much for my for the base of my palm because it doesn't have a pronounced hump. But still, I perform better with it. I don't really know why. It also could be a little bit of a bias because I played years with the G Pro wireless shape, so maybe it's a little bit of that. But yeah, right now, the GPX2, out of only two that I've tested with the bar score, does hold number one. So it gets 76 benchmark score, 7.5 feeding score. Honestly, I should even pull lower because of, again, what I think it signifies for the gaming peripheral market. Um, and you can, if you want, you can pause the video and look at the individual numbers here. Okay, so now let's move on to why I think that the G Pro X Super Lite 2, which is also a mouthful, is just not that not that fun and it's kind of boring and why still it is the best mouse out there. Let me put it like this. If I was tasked with coaching a random person and they had to perform in some eSport and I had like only a month and I had to pick a mouse, unless they had extremely small hands or an extreme fingertip, I would have to pick the Super Light 2 because it's just so boring it, the shape has, it's so boring. It's a potato. People call it a potato shape. It makes sense. It has, this is as opinionated as it gets. It has a little bit of a, of a shape here on the side. This is a, as opinionated as it gets. You can barely feel it. Um, why? Well, it's light enough and the sensor is definitely good enough and it has 2000 Hertz if it makes a difference. I don't think it does personally. And it has good enough clicks and a good enough shape for most grips and hand sizes. Uh, for reference, my hands are 19.5 centimeters by about 10. And I claw, my grip is kind of a claw. You can see how I grip here. This is, uh, I, some people call it a relaxed claw. And the GPX works well enough. My problem with all of this is that I don't know where we go from here. This is almost like the average of all the things that are good about mice and it signifies how I'm not sure where we go from here. Like, yes, maybe the GPX-3 will have some titanium alloy and it's gonna be 39, 40 grams. Is that that big of a deal at this point? I've had a chance to try extremely light mice. I own a very, very large number of gaming peripherals and mice. I've tried some custom mice that have GPX shape and are in the like 30 to 40 grams. I've got the final mouse ultralight Pegasus. I'm getting an ultralight X. It doesn't change that much, really, at this point. I think the jump from 80 to 60 was bigger than the jump from 60 to 40. It's still a nice jump, don't get me wrong, but I don't think that's like a big deal. And maybe I will be a little bit of an old gamer right now, but I remember the big jumps. My very first gaming mouse was a Logitech G9 and then a Logitech G9X. These were laser sensor, which sucked. They spun out. The high DPI thing was known to be good, but we were actually wrong back then because it was, it was actually really bad back then. So usually you bought the mouse with the biggest DPI, you use the big DPI, and then you had terrible smoothing and other problems with the sensors. And then we, and it was extremely heavy, even though it was kind of small and uncomfortable, even though it had two grips. Then we moved on, I had the SteelSeries Sensei, still heavy, a little better. And then the Death Adder, weird shape, very opinionated, but still good enough. And then we kept moving from there. And all of these were kind of big jumps. Moving to a good optical sensor for the first time was a big deal. And then the very first time you tried a good wireless, even with the G305, even without the G Pro wireless, massive deal. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, this feels really good. The first time you try a really light mouse, like the G Pro Wireless X Superline, big deal. Now, what is the next big deal? I feel like we are kind of plateauing as a, as a community of gamers. And is this as good as it gets? And then what if... I am not the type of person that can buy 50 different mice to find out what specific shape works for me. Of course, like I will have to buy something boring like the super light. Is that all we have? Can we not have any more big jumps? I don't think 8,000 Hertz is the next big jump. First of all, Windows doesn't really play well with that. 
they're trying to put patches on it. Uh, something happened with Windows 11 where like now they're coalescing inputs in. Still doesn't work with most games. We have to wait for games and engines to start using this new Windows thing called Raw Input Buffer. Valon, to my knowledge, is the only one that's doing it pretty decently right now. But even then, let me put it this way. The first time you went from a 60 Hz to a 120 Hz, and I remember that eye-opening, massive change. Why? Well, you know, 60 Hz means 16.6 milliseconds between two frames, okay? That's, that's a lot of milliseconds. Whereas 120 Hz means 8.3 milliseconds okay so you're, you're saving eight milliseconds of of latency you can really see that now i have a 540 hertz monitor in front of me i am not even confident even though i've got a really fast visual reaction time whether i could tell in a blind test the difference between 540 and 360 why because it's not a really big difference in terms of in terms of milliseconds so then you go to a thousand hertz on the polling rate of your mouse to 2000 well that's half a millisecond of a difference a lot of people, I think, even good gamers, might struggle, even on a high hertz monitor, to tell the difference between 500 and 1000 hertz. So I, I don't buy that like the next big thing is high hertz. Is it nice? Is it an improvement? Yes. Is it the next big thing? No. If most people can't even tell the difference in a blind, in a blind test, it's not the next big thing. The change in weight, anyone could tell the difference. It's really noticeable. 60 versus 120 hertz, massively noticeable if you're actually a gamer. Maybe only my grandma wouldn't be able to tell the difference between 60 and 120 hertz on a monitor. But, you know, high hertz is not it. So what is it? Is it a 30, 40 grams? Is it the next big deal? Well, first of all, we've had mice like that for quite some time now. It, it's not that big of a deal. I think the actual big deal to move forward is to find your own shape, which as I was saying, Unless people come up with like some actual modular cool mouse and it's not a gimmick, maybe that's the next big deal where you really find your fine-tuned shape. But it's just so so hard. I don't like the fact that now we have to default to a potato shape because it's good enough. So I don't know. This kind of got me thinking that maybe we should figure out if there's any type of better input device. Um, or as you saw in my other video, which you can you can watch here from the ROG Harpace, maybe the next step is software that kind of helps you at least fine tune the mouse to something that actually makes you better. And it does so by using actual math and science to figure out what works better for you. But even then, they can't physically change the mouse. It's only going to change the settings of the mouse. So it still makes the whole situation kind of boring and it feels like it has plateaued now. It's very boring, very, very boring. Um, I hope that soon we will see, oh, by the way, let's not even talk about controllers, okay? Controllers are not the right device for first person shooters. Are they nice so that you can play on your couch, or you can play in a comfortable situation? Yes. Aim assist is a crutch that is needed for you to be able to compete, I get that. They're just not the ideal input device because you're mapping something that is your rotation and in the 3D space, to the acceleration and speed of your rotation to the stick, it's just weird, it's awkward. The mouse is more well suited for that type of aiming, the type of movement, because you can then move at different speeds on your mouse pad and it will cause different speed flicks or rotations in the 3D space. I'll be honest, the only good games that I think, you know, the controller is really the good input for, like Rocket League or other sports games, FIFA, but not FPS games, not even TPS games, that, that's not it. But I also kind of failed to accept that the mouse, we kind of got it right the first time. And maybe maybe we did, but I uh, am very interested. I recently saw someone called Kariyu, maybe you guys know them, actually got to Immortal in Valon using a drawing tablet. And these drawing tablets are not optimized for gaming, you know? Maybe they have high refresh rate enough for drawing so they feel smooth, but they're nowhere close to the type of input latency that a mouse, a gaming mouse has. So at this point, I'm kind of hoping that some person will create some prototype of a new input device because I want to give them my money so they can try it. Because really, I'm interested in reaching the very peak of my human performance when it comes to gaming. And I, I, I kind of don't want to believe this is all there is to it. Because I've got so many mice and I don't even know. Right now, I'm meaning the Outset AX Wireless. Some of you might know that my historical world record in one world Stargus small was actually with the Outset AX. Kind of like the shape. At least it's not a potato. It's really an interesting mouse and it kind of looks cool. So I will be doing a review of that next. But still, I think we have to... We have. I, I need to see a bigger jump. I don't want to believe that we're now stuck in this race where like it's all about the hertz and the... Um, and the weight of the mouse, and these are diminishing returns to an incredible degree. It's very, very boring. 
if you know of any company that's doing something more innovative out there, please let me know. I'll give them my money. I'm going to try whatever they have. I hope that we haven't plateaued like this because it would be very, very sad after all the massive jumps that I've seen in my almost 20 years of gaming. So that's it. That's my opinion on the current state of it. If you have a friend that's asking you what mouse they should buy and they have average hands, average grip, you kind of have to tell them the GPX2 or the GPX1. Honestly, I would probably say, what's your budget? Are you rich? Buy the GPX2. Are you not that rich? Buy the GPX1. Low budget, probably the Viper Mini, still my choice, but still too boring, way too boring. The funny thing is that I almost believe that mouse pads make a bigger difference at this point than mice. Like you'd, you're much better off experimenting with mouse pads because you can actually feel a big difference than you do with mice. There's a bigger difference between uh, Artisan Hien and the GSR than there is between probably any two mice that are kind of the same without any extremes in weight or shape, which kind of tells you something. I might actually make a video about mouse pads and like why I think you should experiment with mouse pads more so than you experiment with mice at this point. Let me know if that would be interesting. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if I'm completely wrong or if you guys agree with me. And I'll see you soon. Bye.